School Council that we would like to begin the process of pulling together a career day, a career fair, or put together a program that would allow our students to get a little bit more of an idea of the enormous variety of employment opportunities and career opportunities that are out there. Because the economy that you guys go into is going to be so much different than the economy that we went into when we left high school and college. So we were very fortunate that we put out an invitation and got a really a ridiculous number of volunteers from a variety of different backgrounds. And we hope that it's something that we're going to do on a pretty regular basis. But that really is going to be contingent. It's going to be based on what you get out of it. And, and what you're able to learn. The idea for me in, in proposing this to school council came from a, a really kind of weird experience that I had when I was teaching. At Oxbridge High School, we, were, we piloted a technology fair and they brought in the outside cool things where they brought in the military. They had a, a Hummer vehicle there with a whole bunch of different weapons on it, firing rubber bullets across the fields and things like that for us to see. And then they landed a helicopter on the field. But before we got to the really cool stuff, I, as a teacher, was stuck in a situation where I had to walk around and, and supervise kids, basically like our teachers are going to be sitting in classrooms and stuff today. Um, and I happened to be assigned to outside. Thankfully, it was a nice day. And I started out as a polymer engineering student and then eventually switched to economics and somehow ended up as a high school principal. So I took a fairly circuitous path. You're going to hear a lot today about how there are many of today's presenters who really didn't take a straight line to what it is that they're doing. And many of them may not stick with what they're doing for the remainder of their lives. Many of them will change careers. That ex in, the, in the course of that experience and being outside, one of the presentations that I wandered over to was the Uxbridge Town Department of Public Works. Because it was a technology day, they had a station. And I thought, oh, cool, I'm going to go over and see what they do because I have none of those skills. So I walked over and I started asking them questions. And we were with about eight or ten kids and um, they had a manhole cover off behind the high school. And our campus had an elementary school that was just beyond a fence that you could see. It was probably about three or four hundred yards away, and it was totally clear. There were no trees in the way or anything, so you could see the elementary school. And they say, hey, come over here, come over here, check this out. And I'm looking down into a manhole, and there's shining lights down, and it's about 10 or 12 feet down onto the ground. And he said, yeah, this is connected to the elementary school, and it's a, what is it? Oh, it's a sewer drain. Oh yeah? And he said, yeah, watch this. He goes, it's recess. Basically all the kids go to the bathroom at one time. And I was fascinated. I was, I was totally sucked in. And so while it might seem bizarre, I have to tell you, I almost left my job in education. I talked to my wife seriously about, I think I want to go to school and become a hydrogeologist. That's how fascinated I was with all of the urine and feces coming out of the elementary school through the sewer. So the idea, what it did for me in terms of listening to somebody and having somebody demonstrate for me as an adult something that I completely did not understand gave me, if, if nothing else, a much stronger foundation of understanding of all the different roles that people with ridiculous amounts of skill play in our economy. I wanted to say thank you first and foremost to the presenters. These are people who have volunteered their time. Some of them are, are friends of mine that I will now owe money to out of my own in the pocket. Um, we all want money. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, others, um, I'm sure, will call in random favors from time to time, like wanting to take their kids out of school and, and go play. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you for each, to each and every one of you. And let the kids know, let you guys know as students, Many of them are parents who took a day off from work today to be here with you. And that, it's not only that they're volunteering their time, it's that it's actually costing them money to come in and present to you. So I want you to keep that in mind as you're listening. You're going to be sitting in 20 minute presentations where they're going to give you a little bit of information about what they do, and they're going to leave some time to ask questions, and they want to be able to have conversations with you in those sessions. So. I know you've spent some time in homerooms and looking at those, uh, 
looking at some questions, putting some questions down with your friends, in some cases, selecting sessions that you would go to for the seventh grade. So I'd like to thank the presenters, if you could, if you're down here, um, if you could just stand up to be recognized. Jen Mendelson and Bruce Ichi. Michael Klesch and Maeve Beck. Camelia Rotaru and Erica Burns. Jonah Bruger. Jennifer Lapis and Danny Sagan. They're setting up their presentation in the room. Rachel Snyder. Nick Zayas. Rebecca Beck and Allison Gillette. Humera Fasihajin. <laughs> On campus without chocolate milk, Jennifer Zina. <laughs> Evan Bryant and his friends from Hadley Public Safety. Bridget Osborne. <laughs> Drew Hutchinson and Tim Sweeney. <laughs> Michelle Equale. <laughs> and Emily Pfeiffer. And finally, to present our keynote address, keynote speaker, and uh, presenter number two, it's Jeremy Daly. Jeremy's in, Jeremy is an international leader in cutting edge serverless technologies. He's a graduate and alumni of the University of Massachusetts with a degree in e-commerce and international business. Jeremy has more than 20 years of experience managing the development of complex web and mobile applications for domestic and international businesses. He spent his early years running a web development agency, working with more than 200 companies and later moved on into executive management roles that faced, focused on product strategy and development. Jeremy recognized that leadership teams require it requires extensive leadership to build strong teams and identify workers and people who have management skills and collaboration skills with one another. And he'll talk about that as he talks about his pathway to what he's doing now, currently, as the Chief Technical Officer for AlertMe. I'd like to introduce today's keynote speaker, Jeremy Daly. Mr. Beck introduced, but uh, thank you for those accolades. Um, so I don't need to give you too much of my background in terms of, um, uh, of what I do right now. I wanted to just get a sort of feeling here. How many people in this room uh, know exactly what they want to do for the rest of their lives? Okay, a couple people. How many people have? How many people have a, sort of an idea? Sort of an idea, but aren't a hundred percent sure. Okay, and, good. and how many people have no idea what they want to do with the rest of their life? All right, so I'm, I'm in that camp. I'm in that camp, too. Um, so I, I figured what I would do is I would start by telling you guys uh, a little bit about how my career path developed in sort of this long and winding and twisting road. And um, it was interesting to hear Mr. Mr. Beck talk about all the different things that, um, you know, all the different uh, sort of 
uh, careers he looked at and different things he did because I think that is a very typical path for a lot of us. Um, so I started, I think, when I was maybe, you know, fourth or fifth grade, I wanted to be either a fireman or a veterinarian. I think that's one of those typical things that all young kids want to be. Those are both very noble professions, and if you want to do that, um, certainly pursue that. Um, but as I got a little bit older, as I, as I got into um, high school specifically, um, I started to kind of think differently um, and, uh, and start seeing different opportunities and different ideas. And so when I was a freshman in high school, I, I'd been playing the trombone uh, starting in uh, fifth grade. And music was fun and I, and I liked it, but I never had a particularly good music teacher until I got into high school. Uh, and when I got into high school, I had this great music teacher named Mr. Demick. And um, he asked me, he said, hey, we need some more trumpet players. Do you want to learn how to play the trumpet? And I said, yeah, sure, might as well. So I had an absolute fascinating time doing that. And uh, at the first Christmas concert of my freshman year, I ended up playing a solo with, with Mr. Dimmick accompanying me on the piano. Um, and, and that just made me fall in love with music even more. And I thought to myself, wow, music, that's a really, really interesting, uh, you know, interesting path. I would love to be a music teacher that could have the same impact on students as Mr. Dimmick had on me. Um, but at the same time I was doing that, uh, I was also into doing video stuff. So when I was in eighth grade, I begged my mother to buy me a video camera. Uh, I got a video camera, and me and my friends used to make these little videos and do all this stuff. This is well before uh, smartphones and everybody had a, a video camera on them. Um, so I had this little Sony Handycam, and I used to make these videos with friends. I eventually got hooked up with the local access station, and we started making TV shows. I had two TV shows when I was a freshman and sophomore in high school, um, both that used blue screens, you know, so like it, they use green screens now, but they used to use blue screens. Um, so we used to do live live TV shows and have people call in, and that was something I was like, oh, I really like video, I like doing this video stuff, it's very, very cool. Um, so I'm balancing that, and then as I progressed through high school, um, I started, uh, you know, I, I kept on with the music stuff, I kept on with the video stuff, but then I was in a lot of uh, plays and productions, and I was part of the, the, uh, the drama club, and uh, I was like, oh, you know, I, I like being behind the camera, but I also kind of like, you know, being on stage and doing that stuff, and so you have all these ideas swirling around in your head, and um, so I get to about, you know, the end of my junior year or so, and you're looking at colleges to apply to, and I, uh, I decided, you know, I applied to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, it's a couple miles away from here, and um, uh, I thought to myself, hey, you know what, I, I think I'm going to do this music thing. I think that's, that's what I want to do. I love music, so I'm going to go and I'm going to become a music teacher. Um, the problem was is that in order to become a music teacher, you have to be in the music school, which means you have to play an instrument uh, and audition to get into that. And so I, don't, I didn't think I was quite ready for that. So there was an option to just apply to the school and then you could change your major um, after the first semester or the second semester and audition and get in. So I, uh, I, I was in senior year and I was finishing up my application and I was thinking, okay, well, what am I going to apply for? Because you're going to apply for some college within the university. Um, and I happened to take a psychology course um, at, uh, in my high school. And I said, wow, this is really fascinating. Maybe I'll apply to the psychology school, and then that way, if the music thing doesn't work out, I can do psychology. Um, but through high school as well, I was on the mock trial team, and I kind of liked law. So I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll do the psychology thing. Um, point here is, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so I get to school, I get to the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, and the first year I'm like, big on this music thing. So I joined the marching band. Um, I, uh, I, 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 they had a, a program where they had grad students that would um, be an instructor for you. So I had a trumpet teacher that was helping me get ready for, to audition and be a, um, uh, you know, and be, a, uh, be in the School of Music. Um, I, uh, I got asked to play um, in the orchestra pit for a production that was going on there. So I was, I was all into this music thing, all into the music. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it, going to do it, going to do it. Um, and then I'm sitting in my dorm freshman year, and a suite mate calls me over and says, hey, come check out this thing that I did. And so I go into his room, and he had just put up a website um, on the, the, the school servers that every student got. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Can you show me how to do it? So he took a few minutes, showed me how to do it, and I started playing around with that. Now I was still big into the music, and I you know, loved that thing. I was still down that path. That's where I was going to go. So we get to the end of my freshman, uh, this first semester of my freshman year, and uh, I was ready to do my audition. But I'm playing this audition piece on the trumpet, and if you are 
a musician and you are planning on applying to uh, a school of music somewhere, um, you will find out that the audition pieces have to be very complex. It has to really show your range, your skill level. You have to be very, very good to get into these programs. And here I am, having played music my entire life since I was in fifth grade, um, working really hard, playing in the marching band, doing all these kind of things. And I kind of realized, and, and my, you know, my, the, the, the teacher that I had at the time, or the tutor that I had, um, you know, was basically saying the same thing. Just, and it was a little bit nerve-wracking, but I just didn't feel like I was good enough. Like I had spent all this time and energy going down this path, and even though I was the best trumpet player at my high school of about 900 kids, um, I was nowhere near a good enough trumpeter to be in this music program. And that made me a little... Uh, it, it, it kind of threw me off a little bit, but, um, but that's one of the things that sort of put the, the stock to the music thing where I said, oh, I still want to play music, but I just don't know if being a music teacher and going down this path is going to be right for me. So I said, well, this computer stuff is kind of interesting and the website stuff. Um, the second semester I took a class on, um, uh, in uh, criminal justice. It was a pre-law class. And I said, oh, I remember all those days in mock trials, when I was on the mock trials team, we went all the way to the state finals. I thought, this is really, really interesting too. Like, maybe I'll take this law class. So I did that, and then I got out of that law class, and I'm like, you know what, I think I want to do criminal justice. Maybe I'll be a state trooper, maybe I'll be a lawyer, maybe I'll, you know, there's all different things that you can do with this kind of degree. Um, and then I left, I left school at the end of freshman year, and I spent my summer, and I spent more time working on the computer, and uh, playing around with the website stuff, and, thinking about it, and then when I got back to school, I said, I really like this computer stuff, I'm going to start going down this path. Took some computer science classes, um, and, uh, and then I realized, as I was taking these computer science classes, um, I said, you know what, I could probably make some money if I were to do websites for people. So I went around to some of the registered student organizations, I said, hey, do you guys want a website? And so I did one for the Sylvan Snack Bar to start with, um, and my payment was essentially free snacks whenever I wanted to, which in college it was a really, really good deal. Um, and so I, I did that, and, uh, and then I said, you know, maybe I could get like real money though. So I went to a furniture company in my local town. I did a website for them for $500, which seems like a lot of money, but it really wasn't, because uh, it took me like, I don't know, 2,000 hours probably to build their site. Uh, so I think I got paid like 10 cents an hour, but the point was is that I, I made some money. Um, and so, as I was doing that, I thought to myself, I don't know if I just want to be a computer programmer. Like, is that what I want to do, just be a computer engineer? And so I really like the business side of this stuff. So finally, my junior year, I, I went to a, an advisor, and there's a program called BDIC, which is Bachelor's Degree with Individual Concentration. And what you can do is basically combine a bunch of majors together to form your own major. So I did a bunch of computer science classes, a bunch of business classes, um, and so I was able to study marketing and e-commerce and, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of the computer science side of things. Um, and then I graduated and my degree was actually e-commerce and internet marketing. Um, but I graduated from college and by the time I graduated, I had already started my own business. I was already doing websites for people. I already had a little thing set up. And actually, my senior year in college, I partnered with another, uh, another person that I had gone to high school with and graduated um, with a graphics design, a graphic design degree, um, and we formed a new company and we started doing websites for people. So that's what I did when I got out of school and I ran this business for 12 years. Um, one of the things that I realized was I was very passionate about building websites and technology. Um, I also realized that I was terrible at running a business. Um, and this is one of those things where I think you'll, a lot of people will, um, a lot of people will agree with this if you're in any of the trades, plumbers and people who do HVAC on their own, anybody who runs their own business but has some sort of specialty skill um, that they're selling, um, you quickly realize that you spend a lot of your time doing the business side of things and less of your time doing the stuff that you actually love to do. Um, you know, so I, I did, I, I did this for about 12 years and, uh, you know, I grew it to, I had seven people working for me at one time and we were paying health insurance and doing all that, that fun stuff, um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't fun for me anymore and uh, I wanted to get back to technology. So I sold that and then started another startup where I was just doing technology. Um, the problem is, is that I did that for four years and from the point that I graduated from college to where I uh, finally uh, ended that second startup, uh, I was working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, right? Because it was my own thing and you just keep putting all this time and energy into it. Now, at that time I had a young family um, and I ended up taking a job in product, a VP of product. 
Uh, and this was a change for me because mostly I was you know, doing the, the, the coding side of things and this was more of a step into management and product strategy. Did that for two years, got promoted to the CTO, got back into the technology side of things, left there, joined another company as a CTO. Um, and then in the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of speaking. I started a podcast about the serverless technology stuff. Um, and now I'm really kind of into, into, into this. And um, I, I, I go to conferences around the world now, and I, I speak about this technology. Um, and I like the education side of this. I like to, to teach people about it. So, this is a very, very long and convoluted story, um, but there's a couple points I want to make here. One is um, that journey, whatever you think you want to do now, is likely going to change. And, and as, as, as Mr. Beck said, it's sort of like that shiny object that's like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, you'd be surprised what, um, what piques your interest and what makes you want to change careers or, or go down a different path. And when that happens, by the way, it's completely fine. Like that is just a normal thing that all of us experience. Um, that we should totally, uh, you know, that you should totally embrace and, and see what else is out there. Um, and then the other reason I kind of talk about this or told you this whole long story is because along the way, even though I've changed aspects of what I do, um, I've always sort of been in technology. That's been my main passion um, once I graduated from college. Um, but there's skills that I've learned in high school and before that, and then skills that you learn um, as you progress through your careers that you're going to you're going to use no matter what job you do. So if you go from being a computer programmer to being a firefighter, these same skills are going to apply. Um, and I wanted to share some of those skills with you because these are the kind of things that when I do hiring now, I do uh, some consulting for hiring uh, technology people. These are some of the skills that I think. Um, that are important to me and are important to you. Um, and these are things that I learned along the way during my journey. Um, so the first one is teamwork and collaboration. So how many here have, have worked on a group project? How many worked on a group project? All right. How many people hated working on a group project? Right? Because there's always that one person that doesn't carry their weight. Right? You know, you know who you are. Um, right? So, as difficult as that is to work in teams sometimes, right, because you're trying to figure out, you know, who's going to do what, whatever, this is a skill that you have to learn, right? So unfortunately, it doesn't get any better. The politics don't get any better when you, um, when you get into a professional space. Um, and, uh, and so you're going to have to work in teams. So being able to work in teams, understanding, um, understanding how to get along with people, understanding those dynamics of, of group, uh, the group dynamic, and being able to collaborate is super important. Um, and also, we live in a world now where everything is globally distributed, okay? So you're likely going to be talking to a colleague in uh, England or in China or in India or in Argentina. So um, there's going to be a lot of diversity on those teams. And that's another really important thing um, that you need to understand and you need to know about is diversity. Um, so diversity for diversity's sake is, is one of those things where it's like, well, you know, I have my views, I have my perspectives. But the more important thing is, is that the, the biggest thing I've learned is perspectives are everything, right? So somebody that was born in a different country, somebody that was born in a different town, somebody that was born with a different cultural background, they all have a different perspective. They all have a different way to view the world. Um, and those are very, very important, especially in tech. Right now, tech, uh, there's about 2% of the population, or I think it's less than 2% of the population, that is involved with technology, um, and technology affects everything. So having that diversity and having those different, differing opinions is a hugely important um, thing to understand and to be able to, and to, be able to embrace. Um, the other thing is communication. So uh, I'm sure all of you are doing essays and, and projects where you're writing and things like that. Um, those skills, being able to type a complete sentence and to put together a thought um, in a paragraph uh, and be able to communicate effectively um, using precise words and things like that that, that will translate um, to others is a hugely valuable skill that you will need to have. If you, as whatever you do, you're most likely going to have to write a report or you're going to have to write a spec or you're going to have to do something that's going to be shared with other people, that information needs to be clear. Um, so communication skills are hugely valuable. Um, 
The other thing too, especially when working in teams, and if you ever get to a management position, um, is this idea of empathy. Uh, right? I don't think enough, we don't teach this to people, it's just something we hope they kind of, uh, they kind of get, but understanding somebody else, understanding their perspective, understanding their diversity, where they come from, what their situation is, the fact that maybe they had a bad day, the fact that maybe they don't understand something, maybe they're, um, they're nervous about saying they don't understand something. Having empathy for another person's position as a manager is incredibly important. And that's one of the, the, the most important lessons I learned as uh, when I took management classes was, as a manager, you need to adapt to your employee. Your employee doesn't need to adapt to you. Um, so when you're managing somebody else, you may have to manage them different. I had one person that worked for me that loved to have a list of to-dos that was 10,000 items long. I had another one that would basically go into panic attacks if they had more than two or three things on their list. Um, so it was up to me as a manager to manage that because that's what I am. I'm the, uh, you know, I was the manager. Um, and then the, the last thing is this idea of commitment to continued learning. Um, if you are doing anything in your job, never think that you know everything um, or that you can just kind of sit there and say, okay, I know my job, so I'm good to go. There's always continuing education that has to go on. That is in every single career. Technology, it changes every second. Um, and it keeps changing and changing and changing and uh, whether you're, you know, there's a new technique for being a paramedic or there's, uh, you know, there's always things, continuing education for teachers, um, things uh, always change and you need to stay up to date on that. So if you have a passion for learning, um, that's, a, that's an important, uh, important thing to remember. Um, and then I just want to comment on passion too because that's one of those things where I think you get advice a lot in your careers where they say follow your passion. Um, that's not always possible, but certainly if there's some sort of thread that can go through your career, um, something you're passionate about at a, at a given time, um, I think that's really helpful to love what you do, um, even if it manifests itself in a different way. I love technology, um, the programming aspect of it is great for me, but I also like the design and the architecture aspect of it. I like the, the idea of product development and product strategy. Um, and I think you can do that in a number of ways. If you think you want to be a teacher because you like education or you like working with kids, it doesn't mean you have to be a teacher if you like working with kids. There's all kinds of other things you can do um, to work with kids. If, you're, if you want to be a teacher, you want to teach people, it doesn't mean you have to only teach kids. There's adult education, there's curriculum development, there's all these other things that you can do. So just to be sort of smart um, about that and, uh, and, and follow that passion that you think is going to, uh, you know, it's going to keep you energized and wanting you to get up um, for work each day. I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, five minutes before we cut. So five, five minutes. Okay. All right. So then I. Are you going to play a game? No, but I put together a, a sort of a. I think it's interesting. It may be boring. It's a bit of a history lesson. Anybody like history? Okay. Good. History people. All right. So I, I wanted to talk quickly, just because from my perspective, I do a ton with a ton of technology. I write a newsletter every week, so I follow along with sort of what's happening in um, in the world of technology. And so I wanted to give this um, sort of this rundown of the history of technology, where we are and where I think we're going. Um, so hopefully it's not too boring. But about 200,000 years ago, right, where humans started showing up, um, we were hunters and gatherers, right? We were moving around. It wasn't until about 12,000 years ago that we slowed down and started farming, right? And that was a huge technological advancement for us to start farming. So that took us you know, 200,000 years to get to that point. Um, about 5,500 years ago, the Sumerians invented uh, written language, um, and then about 4,000 years ago, we invented math, and then it wasn't until like the 6th century BC um, where the Pythagoras and the Pythagorean theorem and all that kind of stuff sort of uh, standardized math, and there was a whole uh, technology that kind of went along with that. From that point forward, the innovation technology was relatively slow, but we, you know, developed new tools and new smelting methods to build stronger swords and things like that. Um, but the next major revolution was like in 1439 when Gutenberg, um, when his printing press was able to start replicating knowledge and uh, maybe two or three decades after he invented that, there were 200 million copies of books that were being shared around Europe, which was just starting to spread all this knowledge. Um, and so there was innovation there, but then the next major thing was in 1752, 
um, when, uh, when Benjamin Franklin tied the key to the, to the kite and, and realized that static electricity and electricity from, um, from, the, uh, from lightning was the same thing. Um, now, 50 years after that, finally you get a man named uh, Alessandro Volta who invented the first battery, which is where we get the term volt from. Um, and then in, eight, uh, sorry, then in 1821, um, Michael Faraday, if anybody's familiar with the Faraday cage, um, he invented the first electric motor. Uh, and then it wasn't really until like 1879 when Thomas Edison put together the light bulb or invented the incandescent light bulb and started the power company um, that you started having powers in uh, power in factories. They started lighting factories, which meant longer hours, was sort of the end of the second industrial revolution. But now there were longer work hours. We were mass, you know, manufacturing things at mass scale. Um, and then early 1900s, we perfected the internal combustion engine. And shortly after that, we rolled out the Model T, um, and people started driving around uh, in their car, you know, in cars, which was a huge thing because you think about it. Just over 100 years ago, we were still using horses and carriages to get around. Um, and then, about what 50 years after we invented the car, we sent a man to the moon. Right? That was 50 years ago. 30 years ago, we got the internet. About 25 years ago, we got cell phones. Um, you know, microprocessors. Or about 40 years ago. Um, so, the pace of innovation over the course of the last 100 to you know 50 to 100 years has been absolutely amazing. Compare that to you know 200,000 years of, of hunting and gathering, and then these, these this pace of innovation keeps picking up and picking up and picking up. Um, even in your lifetime, right? You're all 17, 18, 17, 16, younger, right? All right. So you guys weren't even born on 9/11. I mean, this is, this kind of blows my mind. Uh, but the what has happened in the last 10 years with the, the evolution of cloud computing, right? Which is something that you all take for granted, right? You have your, you have your Snapchats and you've got your uh, Instagrams and you can search for whatever you want. You have every bit of knowledge available to you um, from, your, from your smartphone. Um, you know, 15 years ago, we had these little flip phone things. I mean, smartphones didn't even come around until about 10 years ago. Um, so, the, the point is, is that this pace of innovation keeps picking up and picking up and picking up. Does anybody know what Moore's Law is? One person. Somebody, okay. Moore's Law says that every two years that the, the density of, of, of transistors um, doubles, which basically means that you can fit more and more transistors on a tiny little microprocessing chip. Um, which means computers get faster and faster and faster and faster. Now that has held true for the last 40 years. Um, but that's actually slowing down. We're actually getting to a point where we can no longer make things smaller, right? And then in the technology space, we've got this thing called the speed of light problem. Anybody tell me, can anybody tell me how we move data now? How, do, how are all these things, how's the internet connected? What do we use? Does anybody know? Uh, radio, uh, radio waves? Not radio waves, no, we use fiber optics, okay? Fiber optics is glass strands that we send light through, okay? So light um, travels at a certain, who can tell me what the speed of light is? Anybody? Back there. Yeah. How fast light goes. Do you know what the speed of light is? That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Um, so it's, all right, we're going to do a little bit of math. Who likes math? So math people? Okay, not a lot, not a lot of you. All right. So uh, it's 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second, that's pretty fast. Does anybody know what the uh, circumference of the Earth is? Anybody? It's about 20, 25,000 miles. So can anybody do the math and divide 25,000 by 186,000 and tell me what that number is? All right, I'll tell you. It's, it's 0.13. All right, but there's a, there's a point to this, and this is, why, this is why I find this fascinating. 0.13, which means it's 0.13 seconds or 130 milliseconds. So that means for light to go all the way around the world once takes 130 milliseconds. Now, fiber optics actually has some loss. It's only about 30%, which means light travels at about 130,000 miles per second, which means it takes about 200 milliseconds through fiber optic cables if it was a straight connection for it to go all around the world. Um, but you've got other things in, in the way. You have routers that have to route it because everything's not direct. Um, but essentially, though that delay, which doesn't seem like a lot, um, we have a problem right now where in order to get data from the United States to London or to the UK, 
there is, a, there is an automatic built-in latency of 100 milliseconds. All right, so 100 milliseconds might not seem like a lot, but the speed of light is as fast as we can move data, okay? But that 100 milliseconds is, is there, and, and, and you might not think it's a lot, but if you search on Google, you know how long it takes for a search to come back on Google? About 43 milliseconds, okay? Do you know, um, and, and you may say, uh, have, who here plays Fortnite or any of those games, right? You probably all. Okay, all right. All right, so so listen. So when you're when you're playing when you're playing Fortnite or one of these online games, um, how frustrated do you get when you make a move and your character doesn't move? Uh, you know, there's a, a delay or a hiccup, right? You get, right. So so listen. If your if your character doesn't move. Um, and you happen to get killed, then okay, great, you just start up with the next game. Um, if you're doing remote surgery, um, and your, your scalpel um, doesn't react for 100 milliseconds or more, um, and nicks an artery, that means somebody dies, right? I mean, there are, there are uses, if you're driving a, a, a self-driving car, if there's a self-driving car, and it takes 100 milliseconds for it to react, that could mean the difference between avoiding an accident and getting into an accident. So the point of this is that we are actually at a point with technology, both with Moore's Law and also with the speed of light problem, is we're at physical limits of the universe where we can no longer get the efficiencies or, or make improvements to some of those things. Um, so the pace of innovation is still not slowing down. Though. So even though we're reaching some of these limits, um, the pace of innovation is continuing to go on. And, and that's going to be something that I think is going to be really interesting for all of, all of you graduate, excuse me, all of you graduating soon, is you're going to go into a world where um, we've met some of these physical limits, and the innovations are going to be in things like process, like Gutenberg, his, uh, his printing press, the reason why his printing press was so novel and so interesting was not because it was the first time someone invented a printing press. People used to carve wood blocks, and they would use wood blocks to do pages. But what, what Gutenberg did was he invented this thing called movable type, which were these, these number or letters and numbers that could be um, slid into a plate so that you could go ahead and create pages of books, and then you could rapidly create them and then and switch it out, and you didn't have to do all that carving. And so that basically sped up. That was a process improvement. And so I think the next 10, 15 years, you're going to see a lot of these innovations, but process improvements are going to be those things that you can do better. Facebook was better than MySpace, right? Snapchat is better than Facebook. Not because the technology is different, but because the process is different and it's, and it's adapted to a different thing. So, I've spoken for a very long time. I'm getting the, I'm getting the signal here. But anyways, my point is, is that, or I, I guess I'll sum it up this way. Your career is gonna be rapidly changing. There's gonna be so many things that you can do. Um, in, you know, embrace your passions, find something that you can do that, that, uh, that, that makes sense for you, that keeps you motivated every day. Don't worry if your passions change or if your, or if your career changes, that sort of things that happen all the time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and if you're interested in technology, you know, definitely come, come and talk to me. Thank you.